Then Samuel Thomas and Tantrahidele Esther. All right, so let's uh, begin tonight. And Geshla is saying greetings and hello to everyone. And we start with an apology because last week Geshla um, didn't come on our Saturday class because he was confused. He thought it was Friday, so he mixed up Friday with Saturday and he kept thinking it's tomorrow, it's tomorrow, so we missed the class as a result of that. So apologies for the mistake. Okay, so we begin with a question. Um, someone said, uh, you know, that uh, they are helping uh, some people who are in need. So um, I understand it's a, it's a female, so she's helping these people uh, by giving them clothes and some other necessities and helping them with their accommodation and so forth. And there was a question whether that uh, activity was uh, the practice of generosity or whether there was the perfection of generosity or how do we, are these two things different or how do we make the distinction? And Geshe was saying that if uh, what you're practicing is the perfection of generosity, then you must have three attitudes. The first one is the attitude of the per purpose. The second one is the attitude of the gift. And the third one is the attitude in relation to the recipient. So the attitude of the person is thinking that due to this activity, I will complete the perfection of generosity. And therefore, I will proceed towards full and uh, unsurpassable enlightenment. The second one is uh, the attitude that we have towards the gift, that whatever we give away, we think that it's something that already belongs to the other person and that we were just the custodians of this object that was given to us to keep in trust and now we are returning it. And finally, we should have the attitude in terms of the recipient that says this person is actually my teacher who is teaching me how to perfect my practice of generosity. So unless you have these three attitudes, the giving away is generosity, but it's not the perfection of generosity. It is excellent that right now you are very generous and we are offering support, material support to these people. So you should try to expand your, the scope of your thought and your motivation and think, although I'm benefiting them right now, in the future, it will be wonderful if I could place them into the ground of Buddhahood where they will be completely free from all suffering. So think it this way and just increase your practice. So we continue with our text, The Easy Path. Uh, last week, we covered the presentation of the practice of the perfection of generosity. And the next one in the list of the six perfections is the perfection of ethics. As you will see in the Easy Path, uh, we actually have a very short section in terms of the practice of um, ethics or morality. Basically, it just gives the threefold classification. So if you go into the root text, it says, as for the practice of morality, while meditating on the Guru Yidam on top of your head, contemplate. So you must have done all the six preparatory practices and come to the point of visualizing that you, the Guru is at the crown of your head and you make requests to the Guru. So you say, I shall quickly attain the complete and perfect Buddhahood for the sake of the mother sentient beings. So with these words, you are actually setting the motivation as being bodhicitta and then you continue and you say for this purpose i shall abandon the flawed behavior that go against the vows i have taken such as the 10 non-virtuous actions and so forth so these words are actually reference to the first type of morality which is the morality of restraining negative behavior so negative behavior here refers to the 10 non-virtuous actions. However, the morality of restraining from negative behavior is not just avoiding the 10 non-virtuous actions. It is avoiding the 10 non-virtuous actions. It is safeguarding whatever vows you have as a lay person and safeguarding whatever vows you have 
if you are ordained according to the level of your ordination, uh, such as the Gelong vows or the Gitsu vows and so on and so forth. Okay, so maintaining all your vows and, and staying away from the 10 non-virtuous actions. Then it continues by saying, I shall produce in my mind the pure virtue of morality, of generosity and the other perfections that I have not yet produced and I will increase those which have already been produced. So with these words, we have the second um, type of morality, which is the morality of amassing virtue. So it mentions here cultivating the six perfections, such as generosity and so forth, and any other, other virtue that I don't have yet or I have but I want to increase. And then finally, it says, I shall also place all beings on their ripening and liberating path by connecting them with the pure virtue, such as the practice of morality and so forth. So this one is the last type of morality, the morality of establishing the aim of benefiting sentient beings. So we conclude by saying, I beseech you, Supreme Guru Gidam, please bless us so that we can practice like this. So as you're doing this, you visualize the descent of nectar. So as you can see in the easy path, we have a very brief presentation. Basically, it just gives us the threefold classification in terms of the perfection of ethics or morality. But we need to understand, first of all, what is the nature of morality? Okay, so we say that morality or ethical discipline is an attitude of abstention that turns your mind away from harming others and from the sources of such harm. So you see, it is an attitude, it is a particular mind that abandons, that abstains from certain things. It abstains from harming others. So harming others here refers to the three physical uh, negative actions and the four verbal uh, negative actions. And in addition to that, so you, we abstain from those seven altogether non-virtuous actions and from the sources of such harm. The source of such harm refers to the four non-virtuous actions of the mind. All right. So ethical discipline refers to the attitude of the mind that abstains from causing harm to others through the three, through the seven non-virtues of body and speech, which is killing, stealing, sexual misconduct for the body. And for the speech, it is lying, devising speech, harsh words, words and idle gossip. And the sources or the basis or the origin of that, which is the four mental non-virtuous actions um, of, uh, of, of three, sorry, covetousness, um, of um, wrong views and malice. Okay, so we have explained the nature of uh, morality and uh, we need to understand that we bring into perfection this uh, morality by continuously practicing and developing. Okay, now for the classifications of morality, we say we have three types of morality. The first one is the morality of restraining or abstaining uh, from negative behavior and um, then the second one is the morality of amassing virtue. And the third one is working for the benefit of sentient beings. So for the first one, the morality of restraining negative behavior. So if we look at someone, we're going to look at different cases. So in the case of um, uh, an ordained person who has bodhisattva vows, this refers to um, abstaining or safeguarding all the vows that uh, are relevant to the fully ordained monks and the fully ordained nuns, to the novice monks and the novice nuns, and in the case of nuns, to the uh, trainee nun. Okay, in the case of someone who's a lay practitioner, this refers to abstaining or uh, from the, the things that are prohibited uh, in terms of uh, 
the lay person, whether it is male or female. Another case that we can have is a god, a god who has bodhisattva vows. Now, in the physical basis of the god, you cannot actually have vows of individual liberation. And therefore, what they have, or they have the bodhisattva vows, and in addition to that, they have the morality of abstaining from the ten non-virtuous actions. So the three of uh, uh, the body, the four of speech, and the three related to the mind. Mm. Okay, we come to the second one, which is the morality of um, amassing virtue. So once you have taken the bodhisattva vows, any virtuous activity that you establish with your body, speech, and mind falls under this category. So, for example, engaging in listening, reflecting, and meditating in order to develop the wisdom that is derived from these activities is an example of this. Um, honoring and serving with respect to your guru, your parents, and those who are sick, again, falls in this category. Uh, rejoicing and praising with appropriate words the qualities that you see in others falls in this category. Um, not um, recognizing that any harm that is done to you is the result of past karma and not retaliating and therefore practicing patience falls in this category. Uh, making dedication of whatever virtue you create towards supreme enlightenment is in this category. Making the prayers to develop uh, qualities that you don't have or to increase whatever qualities you have, again, falls in this category. Um, things like uh, sa safeguarding the doors of your senses with uh, conscientiousness and, uh, and recognition, awareness, Again, it falls in this category, relying on your teacher, recognizing your faults and confessing from, your bottom of, from the bottom of your heart in a sincere way and so forth. All of these are examples of the morality of accumulating virtue. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll come to the last one, which is uh, the morality of establishing the purpose of sentient beings. So here we are focusing on 11 types of sentient beings and we want to accomplish their aims in this life and in future life in a manner that is suitable without engaging in any negativity. So first of all, let's give uh, the list of those 11 types of sentient beings and we will explain how we practice accordingly. So the first one is those who need help. The second one, those who are confused about the proper method. The third one is those who have given you help. Number four is those who are afflicted by fear. Number five is those who are afflicted by sorrow. Number six is those who are poor in material possessions. Number seven, those who need emotional support. Number eight, those who, need, who want to have mental harmony. Number nine, those who proceed correctly. Number 10, those who proceed incorrectly. And number 11, those who need to be disciplined by demonstrating miracles. Okay, so for the first one, those who need help. So to give you an example, it could be those, for example, who need to make a very long travel. And they need to travel for a very long distance. And you understand that along the path, they might need difficulties and so forth. So you might give them all the information. You might even escort them along the trip in order to provide the support that they need. Um, also, you might give uh, instruction to others so that they can engage in a livelihood that avoids negativity, right? So you teach them a way where they can live without harming others. Um, and another example is uh, um, offering medicine to those who are sick or nursing those who are sick or helping those who are blind and so forth. So this is acting in a way that benefits the first category, those who need help. 
The second category of sentient beings is those who are confused in terms of the proper method. So what we try to do in order to help them here is to teach them according to their mental capacity, their interest, and their predisposition. So we want to give them teaching so that we can help them abandon and eliminate negative behavior, the truth of the suffering, and the truth of the origin. So what happens is that we need to speak with them and to explain to them that if you continue behaving this way in terms of uh, physical activities and in terms of verbal activities, all you are creating is more and more suffering and more and more trouble. We need to explain to them that there are different ways and different means to modify their behavior so that they do not create this uh, trouble through their bad negative behavior. Then we need to introduce them to the truth of suffering and then explain that this is actually a bad situation, this is suffering. However, this suffering has an origin and there are ways of abandoning the origin and in this way we can get rid of suffering. So in this way, explaining things to those who are confused in terms of the proper manner, the proper path. The third one is uh, the sentient beings who have been helpful to us, have already given help. So here in this context, we consider that all sentient beings have actually played the role of a mother or a father um, in uh, our countless lifetimes. So they have raised us with great kindness. So now wishing to repay this kindness, we're thinking to act in a way that will benefit them both uh, temporarily and in the long term. So acting in this way is an example of morality for working for the benefit of this third category of sentient beings. The fourth category is uh, benefiting those who are afflicted by fear. So in other words, we're talking about people who are fearful. They have some reason to be afraid. And if you act in a way that you protect them from that fear, that you alleviate, you remove that fear, then you are acting in, in a way that falls in this category of um, ethical discipline. So, for example, they could be in danger or in fear of wild animals, such as a lion or a tiger or a crocodile and so forth. Or they could be in fear of um, a ruler, a king, someone with power in society and so forth. So if you protect them from the fear, then you acting with the morality of establishing their benefit. The fifth cat category is establishing the purpose or the aim of those who are afflicted by sorrow. So here we're talking about people who are experiencing intense mental suffering. So it could be the case that um, their parents or a relative or a friend has died and usually the death of someone who is really close to us uh, brings about a lot of grieving and sorrow. Or it could be the case that someone has lost their fortune and uh, they are, again, you know, they're very upset and very sorrowful. So in order to help them, we teach them about impermanence and that has the power to help them overcome this sorrow. So in this way, we help them. We come to the sixth category of working for the aim of those who are poor in material possessions. So whatever the, if you find someone who is lacking in food, uh, offering, being generous and offering food to them is practicing uh, this particular type of morality of benefiting this sentient being. Or you might meet someone who has to go on a very long journey. They are tired uh, due to the distance and you offer them a vehicle. You offer them a ride 
okay? Or you might meet someone who um, doesn't have any clothes to put on, so you make a donation of clothes. Or whatever material thing they are lacking, they are missing, you, offer, you practice generosity with this. And this constitutes the morality of acting for the benefit of those who are poor in material resources. The next one is practicing the morality of uh, working for the benefit of those who need emotional support. So these, uh, strictly speaking, this refers to, uh, if you're a teacher, it refers to those who are attached to you, who are dependent upon you, such as, for example, your students or your entourage and so forth. So you act in a way where you provide whatever they need. They might need um, material support, so you offer them food and clothes and accommodation, so you aid them in this way, but also you give them advice, you teach them dharma and so forth. So whatever need, whatever type of support they need, you provide this for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one is um, um, acting for the benefit, um, not exactly of those who want mental harmony, but acting in accordance, in harmony with their mental state. All right. So, for example, it means that you meet other people and basically you want to give them advice to abandon negativity and to establish virtue. But you try to be very skillful. So whatever you advice you give or whatever instruction you give, you give it in harmony with their mental capacity, right? So you judge the situation and you see that if the person right now is not capable of abandoning or this negative behavior or modifying this behavior, you just uh, step at the back a little bit. But if you find that they have the capacity to do that, then you step forward and accordingly you give them instructions on how to moderate um, their behavior, their physical and verbal behavior. And you act in a way that is in harmony or is in accordance with their mental state. The next one is the morality of, uh, um, to, of um, acting in a way to benefit those who proceed correctly. Those who proceed correctly are those who have faith, those who practice uh, morality, those who have a good conduct. So what you do is basically you recognize that they are good for doing this and you praise them. So if you find someone who has faith, you tell them it is excellent that you have faith. And then you speak to them about the qualities of having faith. You speak in a way that is very encouraging so that the person will persevere and increase the amount of faith they have. Similarly, you find someone who practices morality, a very ethical person. So you praise them for their practice of morality. And then you speak about the qualities of morality. And then you encourage them to practice even more um, other types, more advanced types of morality. And similarly, with good contact, we just praise it and encourage it. So this boils down to speaking in a way that encourages others who are doing something correctly to increase whatever they're doing correctly. Number 10 in the list is uh, practicing the morality that establishes the aim of those who proceed wrongly. Those who proceed wrongly are those who engage in negativity, those who create faults, whether they create um, heavy negativity or middle uh, size negativity or light negativity. You speak to them and you explain the situation so that they can generate regret, they can reduce the amount of negativity and uh, they are persuaded not to engage negativity in the future again. 
We come to the last one in our list, the 11th one, which is uh, um, acting for the benefit of those who need to be disciplined by miracles. So if you have an individual that creates a lot of negativity through their body, their speech and their mind, and they need to be disciplined, if you have the power, if you have um, sort of like supernatural powers, for example, you might manifest in front of them the hot hells or the cold hells. And that individual about, upon seeing these visions of hells will be terrified and they will understand that this will be the future result of their actions. So they change their behavior. So we have given here 11 categories of sentient beings. And um, we say that we establish, um, we practice the morality of establishing the benefit of those 11 types of sentient beings. So we have talked about uh, the um, perfection of ethical discipline. We have to explain its nature and its classifications. There are three types of morality, the morality of restraint, the morality of amassing virtue, and the morality of working for the benefit of 11 types of sentient beings. So the way that we practice is that for a long time, we have to meditate on the benefits of maintaining ethical discipline and the faults of not maintaining morality. The longer we meditate on this, the stronger the mind that is intent, that really wishes to maintain and observe morality will arise within us. And therefore, we will look at whatever vows we have, especially the Bodhisattva vows that we have taken, and think, I will definitely protect these vows like they were the apple of my eye. They are very important. And in addition to that, any other vows that we have, vows of the lay practitioners, vows of Getsul ordination, vows of Gelong ordination, so the different levels of ordination, Definitely, I want to keep those. There, we should have this intention of purity, keeping the vows properly and confessing all negativity that we have done. Of course, for us as beginners, it is next to impossible to have pure morality. So it is very important that we make the prayers wishing that we will have the capacity to practice properly morality. All right, so as you can see here, we have a relatively short presentation from the, for the practice of the perfection of ethics. We have given really the nature and the threefold classification. After that, a very short reference on the causes of morality and the actual way of keeping morality. You can find more information about this uh, in the writings of Lama Tsongkhapa on his works on ethics. So after that, we continue with the next one, which is the perfection of patience. Okay, so we continue with the next one, the perfection of patience. If we look at the root text of the easy path, it says, as for the practice of patience, Whilst meditating on the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, contemplate. So as again, we do all the preliminaries, we do all the requests, and we end up having the Guru at the crown of our head, and we make requests for a particular practice. So we begin by saying, I shall quickly attain the complete and perfect Buddhahood for the sake of the mother sentient beings. So this is, this is setting the motivation. And then it says, for this purpose... I shall complete all the dharmas taught by the Buddha, such as generating the practice of patience and so on, in the others as well as in my mind. So definitely talking about the practice of uh, patience. Therefore, were all beings to transform into enemy without generating anger even for an instant, I shall repay their harm with benefit. So even if everyone acted as an enemy to me, I would never lose this attitude of wishing to benefit them. I would never generate a thought that wishes to retaliate. So with these thoughts, we have the first type of um, patience, that is the patience of uh, disregarding suffering. 
Okay. The next, then it continues by saying, moreover, when facing unwanted sufferings, uh, such as lacking food, wealth, a bed, and so forth, or being sick, I shall consider this to be the result of negative karma committed in the past. By realizing that in this way, a lot of negative karma will be purified, those sufferings will be no longer felt as unwanted. So here we have the second type, which is the patience of accepting suffering. In particular, through being able to bear the difficulties met for the sake of the Dharma, one will get closer to the path leading to the omniscient state. Thus, I shall willingly accept those sufferings and I shall sever the continuity of samsaric and the three unfortunate rebirths suffering for others and myself. Okay, so the third one, which is patience in terms of uh, certainty in relation to the Dharma. So here we have a presentation of the three types of patience. So let's start with the first one, the patience of disregarding suffering. That is in the first paragraph of this section, where it says, uh, where all beings to transform into enemy without generating anger even for an instant, I shall repay their harm with benefit. So having uh, looked at the first one, um, which is uh, not wishing to retaliate and accepting the suffering of the enemy, we come to the second one, which is accepting suffering. It says, moreover, when facing unwanted suffering, such as lacking food, wealth, a bed, and so forth, or being sick, I shall consider this to be the result of negative karma committed in the past. By realizing in this way, a lot of negative karma is purified. Those sufferings will be no longer felt as unwanted. In particular, through being able to bear the difficulties met for the sake of the Dharma, one will get closer to the path leading to the omniscient state. Thus, I shall willingly accept those sufferings and I shall sever the continuity of samsaric and the three unfortunate rebirth sufferings for uh, others and myself. So up to this point, this section is the second type of patience, the patience of accepting suffering. So it says, when you encounter a situation where, for example, you might be not be able to get any food, you don't have a bed to sleep on, you don't have money, you don't have resources, or you might be sick. At that time, you experience some type of suffering that obviously is unwanted. But the proper way to think is that right now I'm experiencing these things. These things are the result of past negative karma. However, by having this experience, this negative karma is exhausted. Therefore, I should not be so intolerant. I should not be so irritated by this suffering. It has its good purpose because it burns up all this past negative karma. In particular, it says here, there might be difficulty in terms of um, attending Dharma teachings or studying the Dharma and so forth. Again, we should accept this because we should think that this, by studying the Dharma, we are actually getting closer to the state of omniscience. So there is this attitude of uh, accepting uh, difficulty, accepting the suffering. So we come to the third type of uh, patience. So it begins uh, from the point where it says, furthermore, it is said that there are great results deriving from aspiring to the understanding of white and black karmas, the three jewels blessings, the inconceivable abilities of the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas and the other holy beings, the unsurpassable enlightenment, the 12 categories of the scriptures, the many areas of the Bodhisattva's practices, and so on. Therefore, to achieve enlightenment, I shall generate admiration, and then I shall train correctly in all the Bodhisattva's practices, the meaning expressed in the 12 categories of the scriptures, and so forth. So um, this is the section that explains the third type of patience, the patience, the patience, of having conviction in the Dharma. So as you see here, we have conviction and we generate admiration. 
and we say, I am convinced in the blessings of the three jewels. I am convinced about black and white karma. I am convinced about the great abilities and the blessings of the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, all those holy beings. And the practices that they follow, they are presented in the 12 categories of the scriptures. So I want to train in all those things. I want to study those things. I want to understand them because I aspire to reach the state of Buddhahood. So that indicates that you have conviction in the Dharma and that is the patience of having conviction in the Dharma. So again, we conclude by saying, I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice in this. And then it says, and so forth, because this is followed by this visualization of the descent of nectar and blessings. Okay, so again, we see that in the easy path, the presentation of patients is quite uh, short. Basically, we just get again the three classifications. However, patients is a very big subject. The reason for that is because the opposite, or if you want, the enemy of patience is anger. And anger is something that we have great familiarity with, with, with. It is a great enemy and we engage in great faults due to anger. So it is very good to cultivate, to understand patience so that we can counteract anger and we can keep anger under control. There will be an incredible benefit that we can derive from this. So first of all, we need to understand what is the nature of patience. So the nature of patience is this quality that allows you to tolerate and therefore not to become upset, not to lose the calmness of your mind when some, somebody else causes harm to you or when you um, experience some other type of suffering. So what happens is that when someone is acting in a hostile manner towards us or when we encounter a difficult situation, the mind becomes upset. It's like we cannot tolerate it. We cannot accept it. There is resistance in accepting this. So we lose the calmness of the mind. Being able to maintain calmness of the mind when this um, situations occur means you have patience. Also, having a firm conviction and faith in the Dharma, it means that you have a mind of patience. Okay, so we want to see how do we perfect the practice of patience. We perfect it when we completely overcome hostility towards others, when we overcome lack of courage towards suffering, and when we overcome disbelief and dislike towards the teachings. So once we totally overcome those, we perfect patience. Okay, so we say that the first type of patience is the patience of disregarding harm that is done by others. So we have someone who is acting in a hostile way, someone who is acting as an enemy towards us. And uh, what we need to do is to take this harm, to take this situation and turn it into a path. So this is the first type of patience, the patience of disregarding whatever harm is done to us. So for the first one, we say that we try to bring this hostility or this anger into the path. All right. So how are we going to do this? We will analyze the person who is um, acting as an enemy to us, and we will establish that this being actually is not in control, does not have self-control. All right. So they are acting under the control of something else. And therefore, if they are not in control, it's inappropriate for us to be angry with them. So we are bringing here the example of uh, 
um, certain sentient beings, for example, you know, non-human beings such as um, negative spirits, you know, hostile spirits and so forth, right? Even if you help them, um, they always act in a way, in a, in a harmful way, okay? So if uh, uh, someone is under the influence of such a negative spirit and so forth, they always behave in a very aggressive way but when we see people behaving in this way under the influence of let's say a demonic force or you know spirit and so forth we don't get angry at them because we understand that they are not acting they are not in control they are not acting intentionally in this way so now we take this example and we say this person who is acting as an enemy to me is in a similar situation they have not abandoned their afflictions. Uh, actually, they are very close to afflictions and they are very easily influenced by circumstances that cause their afflictions to flare up. So they are governed by afflictions. They are under the control of their afflictions. So because they are not in control, it's not appropriate for me to have anger towards them. So it's important when we face with a situation like this not to allow our mind to become immediately angry. And the way that we stop this immediate anger is by considering that anger here is inappropriate from our side. Why? Because the other person is not really in control. The other person is under the influence of afflictions. And we know that when people are under the influence of afflictions, they even come to a situation where they harm themselves. There are people, for example, who commit suicide under the influence of their own afflictions. So if people harm themselves under the influence of afflictions, uh, should we be surprised that they turn around and they harm others like ourselves, for example? So thinking like this, that the other person is not in control has this effect of stopping, persuading us that it is inappropriate to have this immediate reaction of anger towards them. So the next way that we can think in order to stop our anger is uh, whether or not the harm is direct and indirect. Again, anger is unjustified. So if, let's say, someone is the enemy, right, is, hit, is attacking us and physically hitting us with a stick, if uh, we are to get annoyed with someone, then we should get annoyed with the thing that directly harms us. But the thing that directly comes in contact with our body is, let's say, the stick or whatever weapon they're using. But we find it inappropriate to become angry towards the stick or towards the weapon. If we don't get angry at that which directly harms us, then the idea is that we might get angry to that which harms us indirectly. But what harms indirectly is the anger of that enemy, right? So either we're going to become angry at that which harms us directly, the stick or the weapon, or that which harms us indirectly, which is the anger itself that motivates that enemy. The enemy, the person itself, is inappropriate object of the focus of our anger because the enemy, the person, neither harms us directly nor indirectly. Another way we can do, it, we can think in order to stop anger towards the enemy is to analyze whether what is the cause that motivates this person who is causing harm to us. So when we want to find what is the cause, we want to find what is the root cause that motivates this harm happening to us okay so we have to consider that in my past life i have harmed other sentient beings and by harming other sentient beings this has created the karma my karma to be harmed by others because i have created this karma this is actually causing the other person to act as an enemy 
towards me. So it is my bad karma that is instigating the other person to act as an enemy, right? So the root reason that causes this person to behave in this way is the fact that in the past I have harmed others. So thinking in this way, we stop anger towards the person who acts as the enemy. Also, the other thing that we have to consider is that anger right now is inappropriate because the anger that we generate now towards the person, let's say, who is beating us with a stick and so forth, indicates that we cannot even tolerate a small type of suffering. So receiving one or two blows in your body is a small type of suffering. However, through our anger and through retaliating, we create the karma to be reborn in the health in the future and that is a much bigger type of suffering so you have to think if i cannot tolerate a small amount of suffering now how am i going to tolerate much bigger amount of suffering in the future in the hell realm and so forth i won't be able to do it so the smart way is to stop anger arising right now or stop having the anger that wishes to retaliate. Another way to think in order to stop anger is that when someone else is attacking us and is beating us, let's say with a, wet, a weapon or a stick, there are two things here that create suffering. One is the on the other side, external, which is that weapon that the other person is using against us. But the other thing is from our side, it is our body, right? It is the type of body that we have that is sensitive to the blows, to beating, right? So it is just as the weapon causes harm, also our body is in the nature of experiencing that harm. So they are both in the nature of suffering. However, we do not become angry at our body for being a sensitive body. We only become angry at the weapon of the other person and the other person who is using the weapon. So it is unfair, right? It is not a justifiable um, reaction. Another way to think is that hearers and solitary realizers that only work for their own benefit have abandoned anger. They do not have anger. And here we are, we have taken the Bodhisattva vows, we say, I will work for to establish the benefit of all sentient beings. So if anger is inappropriate for hearers and solitary realizers, how more it is inappropriate for us that we have set as our goal to reach a state of enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. So thinking like this, we should stop anger. Another thing we have to consider is uh, that it is inappropriate to have anger towards uh, those who present uh, our praise, our fame, our honor, and so forth. So we have to consider that things like this, such as praise and fame and a good reputation, um, really you know, they, they don't have much substance. They cannot benefit us in this life and they cannot benefit us in the future life. So, you know, they're stopping something which is not of real benefit. The other thing is that um, by criticizing or, you know, stopping a good reputation, a good faith and so forth, it means it helps us um, develop disenchantment towards or disappointment towards cyclic existence. So it is good. It's beneficial, right? And in addition, it helps us, um, you know, overcome jealousy for good qualities and so on and so forth. So instead of being angry for someone who uh, reduces the amount of praise or fame or honor towards us, we should think, I'm not losing anything. Actually, it is beneficial for me that I don't receive praise and honor. So in, we say here that we have to be patient and not generate anger towards those who do stop praise or honor or good reputation towards us. Because we think that actually by acting this way, 
you know, by missing those things, uh, these things do it, the lack of those things does not harm my body, does not harm my speech, does not harm my mind. So it doesn't harm me in any way. However, if I were to become angry at this person, again, I would create negativity that in the future it will result in great suffering. So it is inappropriate to become angry towards these people. The other thing uh, to consider is that I have made the promise that I would lead all sentient beings to the state of Buddhahood. So now, if there is one or two people who dislike me and therefore stop, uh, you know, they do not serve me, they do not honor me, or they harm my good fame and reputation, it is inappropriate for me to have anger towards them. It is inappropriate to be jealous towards them, to be competitive towards them. Why? Because I have promised that I would lead all sentient beings to the grant of Buddhahood. So how can I develop dislike for these people? How can I exclude them from my good intentions? So the other thing that we have to consider is that uh, there is someone out there who is hostile, who is acting as an enemy. Perhaps they have the intention that I become unhappy, they have the intention to harm me, uh, to cause me trouble and so forth. However, this attitude is only causing trouble to them. Right, And if I leave it at that without generating the to retaliate or to cause harm back to them, they are the only one who is harmed by this attitude. However, if from my side I develop this uh, attitude that says I want to also harm them, then both myself and the other person will be harmed. Like in a sense, we both lose. Because if I generate the wish that says, may they suffer, this actually is non-virtuous. This is a negative thought. So by thinking in this way, I'm harming myself. And obviously, I'm going to harm other people. Therefore, um, Anger, again, you know, think about all the faults, all the shortcomings of anger. So this is how it is with correct reasoning. We should analyze the situation. We should see all the faults of anger and be resolved that we will act in the exact opposite way. The exact opposite way is to act with patience without wishing to retaliate. Okay, so as you can see here, we have elaborated on the first type of patience, that is the patience of not wishing to retaliate for harm that is done to you. You can find even a more extensive presentation with many arguments in the chapter of patience in Bodhisattva's Ways of Life. Um, the important thing here is that when someone arises as an enemy and acts with hostility, we have to find a way to transform this. We have to find a method so that our mind will not become disturbed, but the mind instead will remain calm. If you can avoid becoming mentally upset, it means you are practicing patience. Right. So again, this is uh, today is enough for the first type of patience. And we have another two. So we will continue next week. So we stop here for today.